Good evening, and thanks for joining us for what will be a history-making evening on the OSU Cascades campus in Bend, Oregon. For the next 90 minutes on News Channel 21, you'll hear from the candidates for Oregon governor. On the stage here inside Tyson Hall, we welcome unaffiliated candidate Betsy Johnson, Democratic candidate Tina Kotek, and Republican candidate Christine Drazen. Tonight, they'll debate questions based largely on input from our News Channel 21 viewers from the OSU Cascades campus, as well as community and business leaders across Central Oregon. I'm Kathy Marshall with News Channel 21, and I will be your moderator this evening. Before we get started, a few notes about who is in the audience here in Tyson Hall and the format for tonight's debate. Now, in the audience in Tyson Hall, it's by invitation only and includes students and staff from OSU Cascades, members of City Club of Central Oregon, both have partners with us on this debate. And each campaign has been allowed to invite 10 representatives. A reminder to those with us, and they've been warned ahead of time, there should be no applause or any other reaction as the candidates answer questions tonight. As for the format, each candidate will begin and end with an opening and closing statement, and they'll have 90 seconds, seconds that is, in which to do so. Then we'll start with questions. One minute will be allotted to each candidate for answers with a 30-second rebuttal. They will receive visual cues from our timekeepers at 15 seconds, and then a red card will be raised when time has expired. And we thank Myra Flores and Quentin Gomez, students from OSU Cascades, for being our timekeepers this evening. The order in which the candidates will deliver remarks has been predetermined by a drawing. Another drawing determined how the candidates are seated before you tonight. So with the ground rules in place, we'll begin by thanking each of you so much for being here, joining us here in Bend. The draw determined Betsy Johnson will begin with one minute of opening remarks. Thank you, thank you. Oregon is heading in the wrong direction, and the two political extremes represented by my opponents just want to keep fighting with each other. We need an independent governor, loyal only to the people of Oregon. I would ask you to imagine with me a governor who would say, I will not sign a major piece of legislation into law. I will not sign a budget into law. I will not make appointments to boards and commissions without bipartisan support. It would simply transform how Oregon runs our political life. Look at the elected officials who have put party allegiance aside to endorse my candidacy. Former head of the Oregon Democratic Party, Margaret Carter. Former head of the Republican Party in Oregon, Herman Bertschuger. Former United States Senator, Gordon Smith, Republican. And Democrat, former Governor Ted Kulingowski. All have shown the political courage to say Oregon needs to go in a different direction. The path I took is not the easy path, nor am I probably um, a likely person uh, at my age and a 20-year tale of legislation dragging around behind me to be the governor. I believe in a woman's right to bear arms and a woman's right to bear children. I believe global warming is real, but Portland can't lay down the solution and walk away, leaving the economic burden on rural Oregon and natural resource economies. We need to fix homelessness with a sense of urgency, with budgets, deliverables, and accountable people. And with that, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up because it is time to move on to Tina Kotek. Thank you, Kathy. And good evening, everyone. I want to thank the organizers for tonight's conversation here in Central Oregon. It's nice to be back. My name is Tina Kotek, and I started my public service here in Oregon more than 20 years ago at Oregon Food Bank. And I continue to volunteer in my church pantry to help my neighbors. I know that a lot of Oregonians are struggling right now, and we have real challenges facing us right now. We have a housing and homelessness crisis. We have an addiction and overdose epidemic. We have threats to our very democracy here in our state. We have attacks against reproductive freedoms, and we have seen a surge in gun violence, even here in Bend with the shooting a few weeks ago at the grocery store. We need leaders who can solve problems, 
And what I love about Central Oregon when I visit is the can-do attitude that is here to solve local problems. It's inspiring to be here and to watch local leaders take on statewide problems from their child care issues to water to housing. Here in Central Oregon, you're building more affordable housing. Yes, there needs to be more, but you're working on it. You have a new navigation center in Bend. You have the Veterans Village that is helping veterans get into tiny homes and into permanency. We need someone who can bring people together, find solutions, and I look forward to working alongside you to solve problems here in the state. And I will always, always put people over politics. Thank you. Now to Christine Drazen. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. I just have one simple question for Oregonians. Are you happy with the way that things are going? That's what this election is about. It is that very, very simple question. Is your family better off? Is your community better off today than it was four years ago or eight years ago? Because that is what elections have to answer every single time, is are we better off today than we were? And I can tell you, you've now heard from my opponents on this stage, they are the status quo. And so if you are happy with the way that things are going, then certainly you have two great choices that will continue down Kate Brown's leadership and down through their own leadership in the legislature for the eight, 40, 48 years to come. But if you feel like I do, if you believe that we need balance, we need accountability, and that frankly, we need a new direction for our state, then join me. We must vote for change. We must lead our state in a new direction. We can together choose change this election cycle. I am running to lead our state in a new direction. I'm running to fix homelessness, stronger schools, more safety in our communities, and certainly, certainly more affordability for Oregon families. If you agree with me that change is what we actually need in the future of our state, I ask you to join me. Thank you. As we move now to our first question of the evening, I'll share with you candidates what viewers have asked of me. Viewers like Dennis Douglas and Patty Bernstrom wrote in and they said, please, Kathy, ask for specifics. Get to solutions. And that's what I ask you to do tonight as we begin our questioning. Our first centers on what was mentioned here, gun violence, because of what happened a month ago tomorrow at the Safeway in the eastern section of Bend. Two lives lost. Tragic. You know, safety shattered here in the city of beautiful Bend. Measure 114 is on the November ballot. It would require a permit from local law enforcement to buy a firearm and other things requiring a background check and safety training as well. The Bend City Council is endorsing this measure. Where do you stand and why? And Tina Kotek, I ask you to start with the answer. Thank you, Kathy. I'm endorsing the measure. I think one of the most important things a governor can do is to keep people safe. And I'm the only person on this stage who has fought year after year for common sense gun legislation in the Oregon legislature, passing expanded background checks and red flag laws and requirements to safely store your weapons. Both of my opponents, Senator Johnson and Representative Drazen, have A-plus ratings with the NRA. I think it's important to make sure our communities can be safe. And as your governor, I'm going to work hard to do things like making sure every purchase has a background check when you buy a gun and make sure that we can move from age 18 to 21 to be able to buy a weapon of war. Enough is enough. We must keep our community safe. And for our young people out there in the schools, I want to make this. We want to end you having to take active shooter drills. That's just we just need to stop that and we need to keep you all safe. Thank you. Christine Drazen. Yeah, thank you. I am a supporter of the Second Amendment. I believe in our constitutional protections and our constitutional freedoms. And I believe that we, in fact, have some of the strongest and most restrictive gun laws in the nation already. Uh, what happened in Bend was an absolute tragedy. Someone facing extreme mental health challenges was intent on hurting others and was effectively able to do so. It's a tragedy any time that it happens, but more gun laws will not prevent every single tragedy from happening. I think we all experienced and all saw over the course of our most recent experience with COVID that when the governor decides to take away freedoms and take away rights and instead chooses to be the one to make decisions for all of us for how to protect us, we are less free. 
But when it comes to our constitutional freedoms, I will always stand for our constitutional freedoms. We must do more to support mental health supports, but adding more gun laws into one of the most restrictive gun law states in the nation will not prevent further tragedies. Betsy Johnson. I do not support the measure. It has three elements. I think it places an undue burden on small police departments. There was no funding mechanism articulated with the uh, ballot measure as it was written. I have talked to police uh, chiefs in rural places, and they say that the, uh, the measure to be implemented will be extremely costly and will take police officers off the streets. It also has a kind of interesting catch-22 in it that you may have to take a a gun to the range in order to qualify for the permit but if you can't qualify for the permit because you don't have the gun how it's a it's a spiral where in uh, it is really an effective mechanism to try to limit second amendment rights i'm a gun owner a responsible gun owner i support raising the age uh, for certain weapons from eighteen to twenty one i certainly uh, support more aggressive background checks including in, uh, in including information from the schools that might inform when a child is coming off the rails and is in deep trouble in need of mental health services. And with that, I'll open it up for rebuttal. I have to jump in. Gun violence is the number one cause of death among children in the United States today. I'm sorry, I don't believe I, voters are going to follow you, Senator Johnson, saying that you're going to vote differently. Every bill that we had in the legislature, you voted no against. I've talked to victims of gun violence who do not believe you when you say you're going to be different. And both of you voted against a law that said we want to make sure domestic abusers don't have guns. We have to be serious about making sure that if people are going to hurt people, they don't have access to firearms. I have a rebuttal. You said if people are going to hurt people. I watched with interest as Kate Brown has let nearly a thousand dangerous, violent offenders back out onto the streets. And in your advocacy for people not hurting people, did you say anything about that? Did you stand in opposition to releasing those dangerous felons onto our streets? Christine. Yeah, the thing that's so interesting to me about this discussion is that the people that are on the stage with me today did nothing to protect kids in our schools. They shortchanged schools. They shortchanged the budgets for schools. They didn't provide enough money for mental health supports. They passed legislation to actually allow needle exchanges within 1,000 feet of a school. These are not people on the stage today that can stand up and say that they are deeply committed to making sure that all students are safe because they will only do it when it's politically expedient. Moving along to question two, when we put out the call for questions from our viewers, overwhelmingly what we heard most about, have them talk about homelessness. The most recent point in time survey puts the number at just over a thousand across the central Oregon area. The Bend City Council is in the process of developing a camping code and plans for increasing enforcement are on the table. Some neighbors, we hear from them all the time at News Channel 21, tell us they feel threatened by fires right near their homes. Viewer Rod White asks, how would you effectively deal with homeless populations who illegally use public lands and forested areas, sometimes for years? Christine Drazen. Yeah, thank you. I will declare a homelessness state of emergency. Uh, we have got to marshal all resources available. We have got to align all of the efforts that are being that are being thrown towards homelessness. But more than anything else, we can address this issue with both compassion and accountability. Uh, we need to continue to uh, expand access to mental health supports and behavioral health supports. And certainly a substantial effort has been made to add new shelter space recently. But with that, you have to hold people to account. They cannot continue to deprive communities of safe and livable spaces because they are choosing, in some cases, to remain homeless. And in, some, and in many cases, they're facing addiction challenges. And as we've recently heard, they're not choosing to go seek assistance and help to get treatment. This is a solvable problem. We can solve this problem. Homelessness can be rare and it can be temporary. We should not view it as permanent and chronic. This has been an absolute failure of leadership. That's why we need a new direction for our state. Betsy Johnson. Thank you. I'm the only one on the stage here that has actually been doing something about homelessness while we've been discussing it. I, along with other people in Portland, helped repurpose a $65 million wasted uh, jail space and turn it into a place of redemption, hope, and healing. 
uh, we have repurposed this facility and are actively working to get people off of the streets. The crisis that we have on our streets doesn't need to be declared as a crisis. Is all you need to do is just go outside and see the suffering and misery. We should not forget that part of what's exacerbating our homelessness situation is Oregon's laissez-faire attitude about drugs. We've turned the southern part of the state into the cartel-run uh, marijuana operations, and the passage of Ballot Measure 110, which I would work hard to repeal, has allowed Portland to turn into open-air drug markets. Uh, there is a mental health crisis. We need to deploy people that are uh, trained in helping folks deal with mental health crisis. And at some point, we're going to have to recognize that uh, mentally ill and drug addicted people do not make good personal choices for themselves. Our timers indicate we move now to Tina Kotek. Well, uh, let me get back to the question. I do agree that it is unsafe to have folks uh, living in situations where things can create fires. I had the very same issue in North Portland, and I went and said to the city, hey, we have to make sure if we can't relocate this village to make sure that they're not using the types of stoves that can catch the entire hillside on fire. That's a real issue. I believe cities should have health and safety reasons for restricting where people can be living outside. And you know what? No one should be living outside in Oregon. It's inhumane, and we have to do more. I'm the only one on this stage who has a specific plan on my website. As it comes to the urgency of the biggest symptom of our housing crisis, which is unhoused Oregonians, it's making sure we get more people on the street working tent by tent with individuals, connecting them with services, and getting them into shelter and into housing. My opponents here, both Senator Johnson and Representative Drazen, didn't support at least one opportunity to do that with Project Turnkey, which was converting motels into transitional shelters. We must do all of this to help Oregonians get off the street. Betsy Johnson. I would like to rebut. I asked some questions about Project Turnkey because I was concerned about its drain on the general fund as we went forward. I won't go into details, but it's a very expensive and complicated program. I would also ask Tina to reconcile her vote to allow tent cities to proliferate in Portland with her desire to end homelessness. Christine. You know, there's no greater indictment of Tina Kotek's failed leadership than homelessness. She personally advanced legislation which has created the tent cities that we're all experiencing now. Both of my opponents on this stage voted to actually enable Measure 110 legislation. And now it's, now it's clearly a failed experiment. And now people are coming around. Now they're regretting that vote. All along it was a terrible idea. Tina. I don't have enough in 30 seconds. But just be, let me say, as it relates to the law, the law that talks about camping outside did not say it was OK. It just said it was unconstitutional to jail people. And local governments have the guidance they need to set restrictions. And I support that. And we need to make sure mental health and addiction treatment is being served well in the state. And our governor has been absent. Voters said when they passed Measure 110, make sure we have access to addiction and treatment services. And as your next governor, I'm going to make sure that happens. As we move along, uh, we continue with homelessness and its impact and really an undeniable connection to affordability. You look at the latest studies, they show the median home price in Bend is near 800000 consistently. Uh, Mid-500s for the Redmond area, rent averages $1,800 a month. It's also one of the fastest growing cities, as we know, in the country. So Katie Brooks with the Bend uh, Chamber of Commerce asks, as governor, what will you do to increase attainable housing, inventory, and access to affordable housing? And we start with Betsy Johnson. Thank you. We have an affordability crisis because we have a supply crisis. Um, we need to build about 580,000 units uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, as opposed to the paltry number that we're building now. We're better at pitching tents than we are at pulling permits. We need to expand developable land for housing as well as for industry and commerce. Uh, and as governor, I would take a very serious look at doing that. Senate Bill 100 is 50 years old now with very little change to it over the years. I think we need to take a serious review of what property could be brought into urban growth boundaries without damaging our forest and farmland and then remove a lot of the regulations that have made building housing so expensive. The legislature needs to get out of the house building business. We need to stop telling developers and home builders how to do their job. We need to get rid of the endless regulatory crisis that we've got in even sticking a shovel in, a ground, in the ground. And we have got to be able to build additional houses across all varieties of houses. Tina Kotek, please address this affordability issue. Yeah, affordability is related to supply. And also, 
we have to make sure that uh, we respect our land use system because the Oregonians value uh, what we have here. But we have to have housing. And I'm glad Senator Johnson has uh, come into the party because I've been working on this. I have passed legislation to provide more housing options within our urban growth boundaries. I'm the one who said we should plan for the housing we need. We will need 36,000 units per year for the next 10 years to not only make up the gap and get ahead of it. That is going to require reducing the red tape, working with local government to get permitting faster. It's also going to mean having a bigger construction workforce. Who is going to build all this housing? We have to work with our schools to get young people into construction trades because we're going to need to build a lot more housing. And I also support innovative ideas like taking timber from Oregon, turning it into a mass timber product, making modular homes and getting them back out to the community. We're going to have to do all these innovative things to actually get ahead of our housing supply crisis. And with that, we move to Christine Drazen. This issue is one that as I've traveled the state, people talk to me about all the time, whether or not they personally feel like they can afford their own home or whether or not the next generation, you know, they're looking at their kids and they're saying, when are they going to get out of the basement? And, and it's a very serious issue across our state. But I would just like to acknowledge that, that Tina Kotek in particular, while, while advancing policies which adjust land use planning around housing, has been one of the chief regulators to add additional costs to housing units. You know, when you look at all these additional expectations that have been placed on housing, all it does is drive costs. If you want, if you want a perfect world where, where all homes meet all of your climate objectives, it drives costs. If you want people to build in a particular way, it drives costs. There has been years and years and opportunity after opportunity for Speaker Kotek to be able to address this issue in a way that's responsive to what builders have asked for on the ground. And instead, all they've done is add taxes through the CAT tax and add the regulatory environment to the point that we are in this crisis, and it is because of the leadership of Speaker Kotek. Tina, would you like to rebut? I certainly have to because I've worked with developers and land use advocates to figure out how we can move forward in a state in a way that is in line with our values about our land use system but the need for housing. And um, as it relates to Senator Johnson and Christine Drazen, Representative Drazen, they fought me in the pandemic when we were trying to protect people from getting evicted. And you, month after month, we said, I need, we need to keep people safe from eviction in the pandemic. And they were saying, no, you know, one of the things that's going to keep our homelessness crisis better is not having more people lose their housing. So I'm gonna, I, I, feel, I, I feel uh, the necessity mm -hmm. to respond to that. Um, Tina's plan was to stick landlords with tenants that weren't paying their rent in buildings that had continuing costs. There needed to be somebody to stand up for landlords that had had tenants in their buildings, in some cases, for two years without uh, making any payments, even when they could. And so this was a matter of trying to find fair and balanced legislation that didn't put the entire burden on the people providing the house versus the people that were living there ostensibly for free. Christine Drazen will have the final rebuttal. You know, this is an expression of single party control. What we needed was the accountability that held Governor Kate Brown's agencies to account when they couldn't get money out the door to support folks that were actually in their homes. And instead, this eviction moratorium went on and on and on and on in response to an agency failure when the money was there. This is a failed level of accountability where the legislature had a responsibility under the, under the leadership of Tina Kotek to hold Kate Brown to account, get that money out to landlords, and instead, they chose not to. Our next question uh, seeks to sort of put a focus on Governor Kate Brown, since that is the office that you three are running for. And we turn to an issue that will likely define her time in office, her administration's response to the coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic, a two-year period of masks, shutdowns, and restrictions in an effort to save lives. I'll ask each of you to assign a letter grade to the Brown administration's response as well as what would you do faced with a similar crisis? And we begin with Tina Kotek. Well, since Governor Brown is not up here, I'm going to, I think, assign a grade to my compatriots here. We were all in the legislature in the pandemic. And I feel that they were not really responsive to what was going on for people. Again, they fought us tooth and nail on the eviction moratorium. We didn't need people losing their housing in a pandemic. But we had an opportunity to make things easier at the employment department, to streamline how they were doing some of the benefits, because we all remember how much of a screw up that was. They voted no on those things. So I think uh, I'm going to be generous and give them a D plus, 
but their grades in the pandemic were not keeping people safe. And if, God forbid, we see another pandemic here, um, and frankly, as we, if we see any changes in, in COVID, I'm going to listen to the experts and be incredibly transparent with the Oregonians about what it is they need to do to keep themselves and their community safe. And um, following the experts, being transparent and listening to individuals about how we can best move our state forward. Christine Drazen. I'm not at all surprised by that answer because not only did Tina Kotek not hold Kate Brown accountable when she was governor as the head of the House, as the Speaker of the House, she refused to hold Kate Brown accountable. Of course she wouldn't hold her accountable now. Uh, but I will give Kate a grade, and I give her an F. And it's not specifically for the, the health response, it's because of what she did to our children. Uh, we have now discovered on the other side of uh, COVID that the groups that took the greatest hit in response to Kate Brown's uh, COVID actions were our kids. And I'm a mom of three and watching my own family uh, experience having ex being shut out of school. It was absolutely debilitating. And there is absolutely no, there is, it is unconscionable that we are where we are right now with our students because of the leadership of Kate Brown and Tina Kotek's refusal to hold her to account. Betsy Johnson. I would join Ms. Drazen in giving her an F. Um, I'll, I'll, the worst single thing that we did during the COVID crisis was to shut down our schools. And now we have gotten the test scores that validate that our children were academically damaged. We have yet to discern how emotionally or mentally they were damaged by two years of being forced out of their schoolhouses. I would um, not kowtow to the teachers and put them to the front of the line ahead of seniors and old people uh, with no promise to open the schools. And contrary to Ms. Kotek's assertion, some of us work diligently in our own communities to try to get dentists to have the, the protective equipment that they needed after they gave theirs up to the hospitals. We work to get insulin. We work to get people in nursing homes vaccines that were very difficult to get in rural places. I would lead with much more humility and, and establish uh, credibility. The problem with Kate Brown was that she lost her credibility in that of the Oregon Health Authority early in the pandemic, and it was impossible to regain it, thus eroding Oregonians' ability to trust the administration. In the rebuttal, I will remind you that part of the question was, what would you have done differently? So if you'd like to comment on that, let's do that during the rebuttal period. Who would like to rebut this first? Well, I'd be happy to rebut that since um, there's some things were said. Um, I, I wish our schools had not been closed as long as they were. I did not agree with the governor um, having teachers vaccinated and then not getting the schools open. But all three of us were in the legislature. All three of us had influence on the governor, but yet it was the governor who made these decisions. I think it's really important for us to look forward and serve our kids now. We can politicize this all we want, but our children need our help now and we have the money in the schools now to help them, and that's what we should be focusing on. Christine. You know, both of the people on the stage with me today voted against reopening schools. Both of the people on the stage today voted against uh, holding Kate Brown accountable during the shutdowns and certainly over the course of COVID. So it's not something that you wish for or you hope for. It was, uh, it was a difficult time for our entire state, but I can tell you there were opportunities not to just encourage the governor to do better, but to actually require it, and, uh, and the Speaker of the House declined. Betsy Johnson, final I don't rebuttal. want to get into the intricacies of the legislature, but there was never a bill that actually asked that question um, that was without politics. And the problem is that the, the way that the question was asked in the legislature was so suffused with politics that uh, a bill is not a bill is not a bill, and neither one of us voted to keep the schools closed. Staying with COVID-related questions, uh, Lisa Goodman, the communications director at St. Charles Health Center in Bend, writes in part, the pandemic rocked the health system to its core, a one-two punch, capacity crisis and deteriorating finances. Mm -hmm. Services are threatened and extreme circumstances, there could be closures to hospitals. What immediate steps will you take as governor to support hospitals? Christine Drazen, you go first. Yeah, throughout the pandemic, I was a strong supporter of maintaining a strong and viable health care system that was statewide. In particular, uh, advocated for supports for our hospital systems, uh, which were, of course, you know, shut down for elective procedures by the governor. 
we knew how much they were dependent uh, on having having uh, access to those funds. But more than more than anything, we knew that Oregonians needed access to those services. And so it is my obligation and my duty as governor to support a well-rounded health care system, and I would continue to do that, and certainly advocated and fought for that throughout the pandemic. You know, when it comes to what I would do should there be a public health crisis like there was in, under COVID, uh, the governor led with fear. That was her go-to, that little kids were going to harm their grandmas. I will lead with facts and not fear. Betsy Johnson. I was a strong supporter of hospitals during COVID. I had three rural hospitals in my district that um, suffered ferociously with lack of workers and, uh, and the elective procedures being shut down. There was the opportunity to give money to hospitals. Tina managed to put so many strings on that money. Instead of going directly into our health care system, many of the hospitals passed on taking the money because of the strings, including labor requirements that didn't exist previously. So we have to recognize that our hospitals are such an important part of our health care system. Right now, many of them are in serious jeopardy with work sh workforce shortages, paying traveling nurses much more than the, the in-house uh, personnel that have been there for a number of years, deteriorating morale. That is unconscionable. We've got to get more people into uh, health care, doctors, nurses, dentists, and allied health care professionals. We need to subsidize people practicing in rural places if they're willing to make a commitment to stay there. We need to strengthen our health care system all across and not vilify their CEOs and downgrade and diminish their work. Let's move along to Tina Kotek. As Speaker of the House and in the legislature, uh, I have always been and will continue to be a strong advocate for access to health care, affordable health care, and making sure people have what they need. That means supporting everybody who works in health care. I'm a strong supporter of our essential workers. And in the pandemic, I think the contrast with my colleagues is that I supported the people on the ground doing the work, not the hospital CEOs. The money that Senator Johnson was talking about said, if we are going to get more money, make sure your people are getting paid well, that they can get overtime so they can get off the job to take a break. And that somehow was a problem for our hospitals. I'm endorsed by the Oregon Nurses Association, the folks on the ground doing the work every day. And Senator Johnson and Representative Jerry Zinn are supported by the CEOs of the hospitals who for the first time, their financing model on how they do business in Oregon is under scrutiny. And that's a conversation we need to have. Open the floor for rebuttal. Yes, please. Um, I don't think that you, uh, this is where the value of an independent governor, not beholden to a political agenda or the, the agenda of the Oregon Nurses Association would be so transformational for Oregon. We polarized this debate at a time of great crisis and it became very highly political. Our hospitals need to remain viable if they're going to take care of people. And that's where I think an independent governor can bring those sides together in a way that facilitates a conversation. I would also point out that, that Tina pushed through a bill that is going to accelerate health care crises by dictating how mergers and acquisitions work. Christine. Yeah, this is, this is the struggle that we, that we face in single party control in our state, is the ability to pick winners and losers. When the reality and the truth of what we need is that we need balance. We need a balance between having a functioning hospital system and nurses that are in fact well paid and want to go to work every day. They do incredible hard work. We need them. I respect them. I'm grateful for them. But choosing winners and losers throughout this process just harms Oregonians in the end. So the only folks that I'm going to be totally focused on are the people who are coming into our hospitals for care. And there need to be people to provide that care. We don't have a nurse shortage in Oregon. We have nurses who don't want to go back to work at hospitals that have treated them poorly, not paid them well, and continue to pay their CEOs millions and millions of dollars. Just I want to respond to that. What's interesting to me about this, we keep going to this idea that nurses will have some place to work if you continue to erode the foundations of the existence of the hospital system itself. Hospital systems provide unique and important care to Oregonians. You know, if you need an MRI, if you need, if you need, if you need scans, if you need to see a specialist, if you are in a dire circumstance, you need, you need the level of care required for a, in a hospital. We cannot erode the hospital system itself and act like the, the, la the labor will then have somewhere to serve Oregonians. It's just, it's just not realistic. Betsy, anything no. additional? And Tina? Well, you have all touched on the impact of the pandemic on our children showing up in so many ways now. But I do want to explore this further. 
Just last week, the Oregon Department of Education reported statewide standardized tests fell nine points. Ben Lapine fared better with a five-point drop, but still only 44% of students passed math, 56% passed English. The mental health impacts we have really yet to see or define. What are specific changes you would make as governor that would improve student outcomes considering all they've been through in the past few years? And again, I asked you, as our viewers have asked, to be specific. First to you, Betsy Johnson. Well, first of all, raise standards. Uh, the response from the, from the teachers union when our kids can't make test uh, marks uh, high enough is to lower the standards. Portland wants to go to a four-day work week. Um, we need to raise our standards and we need to, to act like every kid, regardless of their zip code, deserves a chance. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is turn schools back into focusing on the core competencies. We have turned schools into um, uh, political petri dishes to the detriment of our kids. COVID notwithstanding, I think the continuing undermining of core competencies in math, writing, and arithmetic are going to be reflected in these miserable test scores. We should all be embarrassed. We have a huge amount of money in our system. What we don't have is the accountability to make sure that we're teaching our kids and that they're graduating with something other than a participation certificate. We have diminished education in Oregon to a point where all of us ought to be ashamed of what we've done. I would not let the teachers unions run the schools. I would get back to the core competencies. Tina Kotek. The test scores are unacceptable and I would all think we would all agree, not terribly surprising given how hard the last two years have been. I sat down with a group of high school students this past week and talked with them about how hard it's been for them and what it was like to have virtual classes and how good it feels to be back in the schools. They said to me what they most need to see is more support in the schools for their mental wellness, uh, to take care of themselves so they can be successful. And they want to see smaller classroom sizes. And they want to see more choices around career and technical education. And you know what? I helped make that happen with the new legislation that we did called the Student Success Act. A billion dollars more per year in our schools. We're fortunate to have those additional resources now as we are trying to help our students recover from this pandemic. And uh, Representative Drazen voted against that bill. And now Senator Johnson doesn't like the bill. And they want to take money out of our schools. What we need to do is invest in our students help them through these difficult times. And we have the resources. As the governor, I'm gonna make sure we hold all of our districts accountable to meeting those goals. You know, I'm the only parent on this stage. I'm the only person that has seen the changes in our schools. I'm the only person on this stage that has watched the decline in our public school system between my oldest and my youngest. And I can tell you, the state budget has doubled in 10 years. Education should have been a priority all along. Our kids should not have had to wait until there was a political tax that was levied against businesses because they were the political losers in that, in that scenario to benefit our kids. Our kids all along deserve full funding. I had legislation to fully fund our schools. My, the Speaker of the House declined. I absolutely believe that what we need to get our schools back on track again is, of course, to raise standards, to restore graduation requirements that Tina Kotek removed, and to get parents back in the classroom and engaged in the learning of their students. But more than anything else, when we tell our, our schools and our kids that are there that we want them to get back to core competencies, we need to provide the supports and the interventions to make sure that that happens. Let's open up for rebuttal. Betsy Johnson. Thank you. I, I want to respond to Tina's comments about the Student Success Act. Um, I believe that we didn't, we, the legislature, didn't establish adequate accountabilities. We still don't have benchmarks that we want to build from so that we can judge whether this huge influx of money is going to actually make a difference in our kids. And the other thing that I'd like to say about that was that I supported that based on some PERS reform. And unfortunately, we got too much tax and too little PERS. I believe Tina, when she said we were going to get serious PERS reform, that didn't happen. We ended up too much tax and too little PERS reform. Well, the truth remains that both of them don't want to put more money into our schools. and. What's important for me is setting high standards and high expectations for all Oregon students. And I'm not sure about these two, but I read the entire 185 report last week on graduation requirements. I don't agree with all those recommendations. I think we should require Algebra 1, for example. But what I can tell you is I'm not going to politicize our schools. I'm going to focus on making sure students have what they need. And I'm going to do the work as governor to make sure our districts are graduating more students and giving students what they need. 
final word, Christine? Yeah, this is, this is absurd. <laughs> this is absolutely absurd. I had legislation to fully fund schools. Of course I wanted to fully fund schools. What we're talking about are people who threw our kids under the bus. Tina Kotek threw my kid under the bus. She threw your kids under the bus. She picked winners and losers, and the losers were our kids. She is the wrong person to put in charge of turning our schools around. She didn't care for 10 years. She doesn't care now. We will stay with the theme of education. Our next question is based on a suggestion from Neil Brown, a professor here at OSU Cascades, and Kirk Schuler from the OSU Board of Trustees. Describe your beliefs in the role of higher education as it relates to prosperity and societal growth, and what are your priorities when appropriating funding for higher education? Tina Kotek. Yeah, as Speaker of the House, I have fought uh, to make sure we could increase our base budgets for our universities and community colleges, as well as increase student assistance uh, based on income. That's very important. We have a challenge here of funding our universities and community colleges. I believe in a higher education for those students who want it, and it has to be there. And our institutions of higher education, like OSU Cascades, is providing economic development and places for innovation and growth. I fully support that. What I want to see going forward, my focus will be in my first administration is helping our community colleges have more stable and sustainable funding. That's going to be critical if they are there month after month, year after year, to provide those places for new skills and new workforce development. And making sure we increase the Oregon Opportunity Grant so students can have income-based financial assistance so they can afford college and leave as debt-free as possible. Christine Drazen. Yeah, our institutions of higher learning are essential to the future of our state, uh, especially, you know, I, I talk quite a bit about community colleges in particular. I'm grateful to be here on uh, the OSU Cascades campus today and recognize the value of, of the university system, but there's something really fantastic and unique about community colleges as well in that they're low barrier. Um, you, anyone can go to a community college and, and advance their life skills and go on to pursue a technical education or a new job. And, that's, and that is very important to our system. But we also need our university systems themselves to commit to helping students be done in four years. That helps control costs. We need our university systems to commit to make sure that if a student gets a credit or, or if they pursue something during high school, that it will be accepted in the university. That helps control costs. There's a lot that we can do to support our university system, but they also need to help support students in those ways. I think this is one of the few things that all of us agree on. Uh, as one of the state's budget writers, uh, I also help fund base budgets, as well as a robust capital construction, including a new building at this campus. Uh, we need to have proper facilities uh, in order to educate people. I also agree that the community college pipeline into the universities is very important, and that seamless transfer of credit and the ability to, to move seamlessly from community college to higher education is very important. We have got to have the institutions stop cannibalizing each other. We have seven universities, uh, and all of them have been in a competition for money to the point that they're damaging each other. We need to identify spires of excellence. We need to fully fund them. We don't need every university to be all things to all people. But our university system and its complement, the community college system, is absolutely essential. And then last, last but not least, while we all value uh, higher ed, not every kid needs a four-year college degree. We've got to prepare them to go into the technical uh, um, issues and trades. Thank you. Well, since we've had agreement, do we need rebuttal on this one? All right. With that, we will move along then. I don't think we'll have agreement on this one, but I'm just guessing. Uh, this year's Supreme Court decision, sending abortion law to the state level, inspires this next viewer question. Right now in Oregon, there's no ban or limit, and consent from parent is not required. What do you believe is the moment life begins, and based on this, does Oregon law need to be changed? And we get, begin with Christine Drazen. Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, this has uh, become one of the only things people know about me in this race, thanks to my opponents on the stage today, that I happen to be a, a pro-life woman, and I've never shied away from my pro-life values. Uh, I believe that uh, Oregon, in fact, is among the most extreme in the nation for our current uh, abortion laws. Uh, we are one of the few places in the nation, I think there's only a handful of others, where you can pursue an elective abortion up until the day before birth. 
uh, that's that's no longer that's no longer choice. Uh, late term abortions are not the same thing as as choice from my perspective. But that's Oregon law, and I have said over and over and over the course of this campaign that I will uphold the law, and I think that's important for people to know as. As uh, my opponents want to distract and divide, this is a lightning rod issue for Oregonians. And they are using this as a way to distract from their failed records. But what's important to know is that we need change in our state, and I will uphold the law. Move to Betsy Johnson. I am pro-choice, unapologetically pro-choice. I was on a Planned Parenthood board before Tina came to Oregon. Um, I am not a doctor, so I am not prepared to, to opine on the moment of conception. I believe that an abortion is a medical decision between a woman and her physician, her family, her uh, any other counselors in her life. But I am pro-choice. I voted for many of the laws that caused Oregon to have in statute a pro-choice uh, articulation of, uh, of Oregon's position. And under Governor Johnson, Oregon would remain solidly pro-choice. Tina Kotek. You know, accessing abortion, um, which is health care, is a very personal issue. A woman came up to me um, last week, actually, and grabbed me by the arms and said, if there hadn't been choice, I wouldn't be alive today. These are very personal issues. And you know what? Who shouldn't be in the middle of this? The government. I don't believe our laws are extreme here, like Representative Drazen says. I think they're in line with where Oregon values are. And when the Dobbs decision overturned Roe v. Wade, Oregonians stood up and said, we want to make sure that we protect reproductive health care in this state the way we have in law. And the next governor has to make sure we stay the course. It's not enough to say you're pro-choice. You have to be a champion on this issue. And that's why I'm the only one on this stage endorsed by the Planned Parenthood PAC of Oregon, Pro-Choice Oregon, the Mother PAC, and other organizations who are focused on health care for all Oregonians right now, regardless of what the Supreme Court does. Betsy, you've indicated you'd like to rebuttal. Yes. Um, I wasn't allowed to present credentials for Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood now is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Democrat Party. We weren't asked to fill out a form or to present credentials. And um, I reject the notion that there's any insinuation that I'm not completely pro-choice. I am and will remain so. Christine? Yeah, I just uh, want to just say this, just for clarification. We're talking about using public funds for abortion tourism, and my opponents on the stage don't think that's extreme. It's beyond the pale. Tina, final word? My stance on that is making sure health care is available to those who need it. And we're in a critical time in our country, and this is a time to be a champion on this issue. And I have to take issue with Senator Johnson's comments. The reporting on this issue begs to differ. She was invited to a plan for the Planned Parent, invite, to apply for the Planned Parenthood endorsement. She didn't apply for it. And Representative Drazen, when she says, I'll just follow the law, a governor can do a lot of damage, even if there's a law in the books, stopping agencies, not being a champion, not moving resources to help Oregonians. So you cannot trust that statement. Let's turn our attention now to Measure 110 and its impact. Community members Bob Perry and Lana Davis both wrote in to News Channel 21 with this question. It's now been almost two years since Oregonians passed it, decriminalizing small amounts of illegal drugs and directing more money to addiction recovery services. Some say, like Lana and Bob, it's led to a lax response to drug use. Others say 16,000 have gotten help because of it. As governor, would you let 110 stand or would you work to repeal it? And we start with Betsy Johnson. I would actively work to repeal it. I campaigned against it. I voted against it. I think it is a terrible um, measure passed by the voters. I think there was a disingenuous campaign about it. Set that aside. The other problem is that the state was slow to get the funds out the door, and I'm very concerned about the accountability of the recipients of the funds. Did they have to, in the application process, demonstrate a track record of successful treatment of drug addiction? Um, the drug problem in this state, combined with what's happening in the cannabis fields down in the southern part of the state, has made us a very attractive place for people who abuse or use drugs. If the legislature wouldn't re-refer ballot measure 110 to the voters to get another crack at it, I would lead the charge to get sufficient signatures to, to uh, put it to the voters again. 
um, this uh, the whole drug addiction problem is accelerating, accelerating and exacerbating our homeless problem, our mental health problems, and that bill needs to be re-referred. Tina Kotek. The harsh reality is there are a lot of people dying today from addiction in our state, and we have to do a better job. And when voters said they supported Measure 110, they said go figure out a better way than just throwing people in jail and cycling them through jail. Get them treatment, get them health care to get well. And I'm not going to throw in the towel. We have a slow start. We have uh, an agency under the Oregon Health Authority that's been, I will say, incompetent. Our governor has been absent on making sure these dollars could get out. As your governor, I will work harder and more effectively to make sure we are seeing the new source of revenue going to more treatment in our communities. But we don't walk away from this issue. People are dying. We have to take it seriously. And while Measure 110 may be imperfect, and I would support strengthening the connection of when someone is uh, interacting with law enforcement to get into treatment, that doesn't mean we throw the whole thing out. Let's just focus on solving the problem and helping people get health care. People are dying because of Measure 110. 20% more overdose deaths. Measure 110 enables addiction. And the response to Measure 110 has focused on harm reduction. Just to put that in plain English for people that don't follow along the insider legislative language, that means needle exchanges. That, that means instead of getting people into treatment, you are enabling the continued use of illicit drugs in open spaces in Oregon. I mean, the fact that we have the level of addiction in our state this is, this is stunning to me. 18% of all Oregonians ages 12 and up are addicted to a substance in the state of Oregon. It's shocking. It is catastrophic proportions. And yes, people are dying, but people are dying because we have passed misguided legislation, and as governor, I will push to repeal it. We cannot move forward and address our homeless crisis, the crisis in our schools, the crisis in our families. Our social fabric is fraying because of poor judgments like this. We have got to repeal 110. Bessie. I would also speak to the matter of urgent, urgently <laughs> repealing it. Um, $800 million has been pushed out the door with precious little accountability. The state of Oregon, under Kate Brown's failed leadership, has had too many agency failures where we have wasted huge amounts of money, and everybody just sort of goes, oh, okay, uh, we'll do it better the next time. You can cite example after example. I don't want to waste $800 million or take it up beyond a billion when it's fully funded and then figure out that it's not working. I think that there is a clarion call to act now. I just want to point out the clarion call to act now is after both of my opponents passed enabling legislation for 110 through the legislative process. The call was when Measure 110 was before voters to stand up and say this is a terrible idea, which I did at that time, and as governor I will work to repeal it. So my 30 seconds, I, let me get this right. We have people dying. We have an addiction epidemic in our state. And we're going to spend time repealing it? You know how much time that takes? How about we just dig in, make sure the dollars are getting out the door to the people who need it. We can, we can talk about accountability. We can chew, walk and chew gum at the same time. Get more recovery services out there. Make sure folks are accountable. And frankly, get people healthy. And this is the definition of Tina Kotek's approach to the governor's office. Don't change course. Don't change direction. Keep doing more of the same. Oregonians need change. If we can't see what's right in front of us on Measure 110, she won't see what needs to be changed in any other category. This is the perfect example of why we need change and we cannot have Tina Kotek as our next governor of the state of Oregon. I just want to point out that the voters of Oregon passed ballot measure 110. The legislature, having been handed that verdict, that judgment by the voters, needed to put in some implementing language. Uh, so to suggest that I had voted for 110 and didn't campaign against it is categorically untrue. Tina, a final word? Okay. Well, Oregonians love their environment, no doubt about that, especially here in beautiful central Oregon. And right now, thousands of acres of land are burning across the state, more than 300,000 in the state in recent weeks, and more than 100,000 right here in central Oregon. Longtime Bend resident Karen Johnson writes, climate change is happening, which causes the drought, which doesn't provide enough rainfall to keep the forest from burning. Should we look to California's carbon cap or other ways to protect the land? What steps would you take as our next governor? Tina Kotek. I think it's a two-pronged approach, as 
uh, our next governor. One is helping our communities be more climate resilient. This is the reality. The world is changing. We see the fires. We feel the droughts. We see everything happening. We have to help our communities be more safe. And I supported a very large package in, in the last session about getting more dollars out for fire suppression, helping communities adapt to what will continue to be a big challenge. But we cannot stop doing our part here to reduce carbon pollution, to reduce climate change and what's happening in, in, on the planet. Um, and as the next governor, I'm going to make sure we stay the course on 100% clean electricity by 2040 that I helped pass, make sure that we do the things that can reduce the carbon pollution, the air pollution that is increasing climate change. And I'm the only one on the stage that is committed to doing that and has a plan to do that. Christine Drazen. You know, it's really important that we do support resilient communities given, uh, given our changing climate. And that means more water storage. It means more conservation. It means that we identify when there have been lightning strikes and there's a fire that started and we put fires out rather than waiting until they're mega fires. Uh, when it comes to uh, the fires that we had in particular in 2020, that was, you know, a million acres of fires burned. The emissions from that was equivalent to a year of cars on the road in Portland. It is absolutely essential that we look at management and better management of our forests in this, in this new era, and that we do everything that we can to make our communities and our state more resilient long-term. Climate change is real and Oregon needs to do its part to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. The first thing that we can do is stop letting the place burn down every year. The amount of pollution that we put into the atmosphere with these mega conflagrations is unacceptable. Uh, in addition to damaging communities and, uh, and the jobs and the economies around those uh, huge fires. We need to align our policies with the federal government. We need to hit fires harder and faster to put them out when they're smaller. Oregon has an earned reputation for what's called initial attack. As governor, I would make sure that we had adequate boots on the ground, adequate air assets, and a mindset that says, let's put these things out before they turn into mega fires. We also need to employ innovation in fighting fire, um, but primarily we need to align our forest practices with, uh, with the recognition that damaged forests that are overgrown are, are a source of huge fire. We need to thin, we need to prescriptive burn, we need to make our forests more resilient. We need to do that with the federal government. Floor is open for rebuttal. So I always find it really fascinating when we're talking about climate action. As my colleagues here, Representative Drazen and Senator Johnson will say, we believe climate change is real. But then we have a conversation about forest management. I'm not saying that we shouldn't manage our forests better or be you know, more responsive to the wildfires. But that is not is what is causing climate change. It is us and our pollution and what we're doing. We have to continue to move forward in this state to reduce our carbon footprint. It's not just about wildfires and it's not just about forest management. And I haven't heard any plans from either of them of what they're actually going to do, except tear up the executive orders of Kate Brown on day one. I want to comment on those executive orders. Kate Brown could not get through the people's branch of government, her drastic and draconian cap and trade. And so she got it through executive order that's now being baked into administrative rules in a lot of out of control agencies. We need practical solutions to climate change. We don't need Portland solutions that come at the expense and on the backs of rural Oregonians and rural economies. We have to have implementable solutions, and that's why we need an independent governor to bring both sides together and figure out what's the best for the environment and the economy. Yeah, we cannot look at uh, the issue of climate and just view it like my uh, like, like the Speaker of the House viewed it, which is simply a shortcut to a new tax. Uh, Oregon is actively and has actively been engaged in doing its proportional part to address climate. But for us to take out an on outsized burden to respond to climate just simply burdens families. It drives up costs to drive. <laughs> the price of gas will go up. Uh, the price of heating your home will go up at a time where inflation is bearing all of us. It's the wrong response for us to take on more responsibility for the, for the global climate effort when we are doing our own part right now. We are now at the one hour mark in this debate and I thank our candidates for staying to the time cues and being very polite about that and uh, giving each an opportunity to speak. We are going to take a quick break and when we come back we'll continue to talk climate change and the impact of the drought here in Central Oregon, particularly on wells.
We'll be right back.